Let's give thanks. Father, we are thankful for all of your blessings. And now as we have gathered uh, these tithes and offerings, we, play, we pray for your blessing upon them, that you would use them for the furtherance of your kingdom, that you would continue to show us how uh, dependent we are upon you and how we can assist in the work that goes on in the world through what you've given us, uh, both in our hearts and minds, uh, and then financially as well. So help us to be a generous people and uh, to look and expect and anticipate your great work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would uh, turn in your Bibles with me this morning to 1 Thessalonians. The screen says 2 Thessalonians, but it's 1 Thessalonians 2. 13 to 16, First Thessalonians. Janie, thank you so much for sharing your testimony this morning. Uh, after 19 years, there's still a lot I'm learning about you. And, uh, but thank you so much. What an encouragement to us. And it fits right in with what we're going to be talking about this morning. So let's uh, read together uh, 1 Thessalonians 13. Or 2, verse 13 to 16. This is the Word of God. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but, but as what it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God and oppose all mankind, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. And this is the word of the Lord. Father, as we come to your word, may we submit ourselves to your word, to the work of the Spirit, that we would hear from you, that we would learn of you, that we would grow it not only in understanding, but uh, in our wisdom, being able to apply what you've taught us, being able to put it into practice in our daily lives, seeing, even as we hear the, the sermon preached this morning, seeing where you are at work in our lives and where you would want change to take place. We know that you are a God who is at work in us to sanctify us, to make us more and more like Christ. So do that work now. Change us, change our hearts, give us insight, give us uh, an illumination by your Spirit that we might know you better, that we might know your will for us better, that we might be more obedient, that we would love you more. In the name of Jesus, amen. So where do you find community? Where do you find community? Who knows you best and provides support when you need it? We just heard a wonderful testimony about God's community, the way that God's family surrounded Janie at various different points in her life. So where do you find community? What, what shapes your community? Recent, recent statistics reveal a few, few things that I think it's uh, good for us to know and be reminded of. 52% of Americans report feeling lonely, while 47% report their relationships with others are not meaningful. Only 59% of Americans say that they have a best friend and 12% say that they feel that they have no close friends at all. 52% of Americans have felt left out at some point in their lives. 53% of Americans cite shyness as the reason why it's difficult to make friends. 48% of Americans reported that they sometimes or always feel like no one knows them well. Many Americans are single, a status that can directly affect their feelings of loneliness. Washington, D.C. is the first place, takes first place as far as loneliness, with 70% of adults being single. Um, 
we might say that's understandable, the kind of people that live and work there. Uh, South Carolina takes second place. 49% of the adult population there is single, and its most searched term on Google is, I'm lonely. Arizona comes in third place. Only by 0.11% to South Carolina. Arizona comes in third place with 48.89% of adults adults being single. Single or not, 57% of Americans report eating all meals alone. 57%. COVID has no doubt played a large role in this. Numbers rose dramatically, drastically, traumatically during COVID, but they haven't receded to levels where they were before. Loneliness is at an all-time high. Being alone, feeling lonely is a a pandemic greater than any uh, that we would experience from COVID or another disease. And our study of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Thessalonians describes a community, a church, and how it is shaped by the gospel. And let me remind you of what we've learned so far. The first Sunday that we had in this series was just three weeks ago, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 4. All who are in the gospel-shaped community are never alone, brought together by God's electing love. Remember the, the term that I gave you, the cruisism, less alonians. You are less alone because you are in the community of God's people. You are less alone because you have this family of support. Uh, continuing that theme, Dave preached on the next passage, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 to 10. God's gospel-shaped community has been chosen by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and abounds in hope. Last week, we looked at the passage right before this one, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. If you're in God's gospel-shaped community, it's because you've believed the gospel, and now you've been entrusted with the gospel, and you are to give the gospel away. All of these shaping forces, loved by God, chosen by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, abounding in love, entrusted with the gospel to share the gospel— are forces that bring us together, that unite us. As I mentioned in the opening sermon in this series, this gospel-shaped community is made up of Lessalonians. We want Rincon, every church, but we, we have control over what God is doing here. We have power uh, with Him, in Him, Uh, to make a difference, to be a community that is shaped by the gospel and provides a home for all who come. Know, live, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today we learn more about this, what a gospel-shaped community looks like. God's gospel-shaped community is shaped by the word of God and through suffering. God's gospel-shaped community community is shaped by the word of God and through suffering. Our vision here at Rincon Mountain is to be faithful to the scriptures in order that we might know, live, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing that in order to multiply disciples and churches. So we must be a community that receives the word of God, a community that receives the word of God Paul says in verse 13, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as, it really, as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. We should be thankful when others receive the word of God as the word of God. We should be thankful when others receive the word of God as the word of God. Why? Because only God can make someone able to understand the words of men as the words of God. He is the one who enlightens the eyes of our hearts. Members of his community have been made alive by the Holy Spirit. We call this regeneration. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. 
which literally means beginnings, right? It's beginnings, and it's right at the beginning. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made all things. He made all things good. But then man fell into sin. Man sinned, and in that man, Adam, all of us sinned. All of us now fall short of the glory of God. And when sin entered in through Adam's disobedience, death entered in. We are spiritually dead until the Holy Spirit makes us alive, until he regenerates us. When we're regenerated, we're given new eyes, spiritually alive eyes that allow us to see and understand God's word as just that, God's word. This is true even when we hear God's word from the mouths of men. We're able to discern by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit that what is being said is or perhaps is not the word of God. And that's why it's so important that we teach our children to hear the word of God, to read the word of God, to understand the word of God. To be taught on their own to read is such a great thing, right? That's uh, Shelly homeschooled all three of our children up through second grade so she could teach them how to read. And her basic textbook, the Word of God. The Word of God. That's That's a great way to teach your children to read. They need to be raised to believe these words are the very Word of God. And that's why we must read the Word of God on our own on a daily basis. That's why we're a community that is faithful to the Scriptures, faithful to the Word of God. Though written on paper with pen and ink by men, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is such an important doctrine, an important theological point, but it's It's not just a theological point. It's not just up here. It's for us personally as we see God's word take root in our hearts. And we rejoice then when when we hear and see others receiving this same word of God that we have received. We rejoice in that. We're thankful to God because God is the one who's done it. He is the one who opens our minds, our hearts, gives us life, brings us life through his word. And, and this is why others should w- hear the word of God from us. Now, some have compared the, the human body to the, uh, to the makeup of a good gospel presentation. Uh, this analogy uh, gives the idea, the picture that uh, the, the uh, main points of the outline are, are like the uh, skeleton that we, that we carry around with us. Uh, The main points, uh, like say, for example, of evangelism explosion, grace, man, God, Christ, faith, that they make up the skeleton. And then you add illustrations and and, uh, personal testimony, and that gives flesh and muscle to that skeleton. But it's not alive. It's not a gospel presentation until you add the Word of God. Until the Word of God is spoken, until the Word of God is given, it's the Holy Spirit's work through the Word of God that brings life, that brings regeneration. So you have to, you must speak the Word of God into others' lives. In the new members class, which I know a lot of you, it's been quite a while since you've been through that class, Uh, But we talk about three gospel conversations that each one of us ought to be able to engage in. The first being our own personal conversation with God. Some call it preaching the God to yourself, or preaching the gospel to yourself. Preaching the truth to yourself every morning, renewing your knowledge of the gospel and how God has saved you. Starting out the day that way, starting out the day being reminded of how the gospel has saved you and is is saving you, is changing you, is sanctifying you. The second conversation is speaking the gospel to others who are already believers. Speaking the gospel to other believers is the way that we grow. We all need the gospel. We can sometimes be deluded to think that the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, 
life, death, resurrection, ascension, that the gospel is just for us when we began, when we became a Christian. Well, that's the, the, the gospel. That's, I already understand the gospel. Now I'm a Christian. Now I need to move on to bigger and better things. Well, there is nothing bigger and better than the gospel. There's nothing bigger and better than understanding the gospel. And yes, we can dive into all the theological ramifications and doctrines that are associated with the gospel and all the, go all the Bible stories. Those are good for us to learn, but we never leave the gospel. We carry around with us, Paul says, Christ's death that we would be reminded all the time of the price of our Savior for us, the price that he paid. So every time we share the gospel with others, we must speak the word of God. And if we don't, then the gospel presentation that we give will lack life. So rejoice and give thanks to God for enabling us to receive words of men as the word of God. And this is magnified even more when we understand that the word of God, when received as the word of God, goes to work in us. That, that word of God that we receive is at work in us. Well, how does that work? Well, the Holy Spirit, Jesus tells us, will teach us all things and bring to your remembrance all that Jesus has said. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And Paul reminds us that the word of God works in us by the power of God. He says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The word of God is the power to salvation. It comes through the word of God. For the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It's through the gospel that we come to know God and that we express faith in him after he's regenerated us. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians that the word of the cross, the gospel, is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The gospel has power in it. The Word of God works in us by the power of God to produce faith and righteousness. This is because the Word of God is living and active, sharpened than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God is living and active. It is alive when the Holy Spirit regenerates us and we begin to understand the Word of God. It's a living Word. It's a Word that brings life. It's a Word that brings hope. As that passage says, it pierces to divide joint and marrow, soul and spirit, to, to reveal to us the thoughts and inclinations of our hearts, to convict us of sin. The, the Word of God is at work in you, even now as I'm preaching. The Holy Spirit is using the Word of God to remind you of things in your own life where you've experienced the things that we're reading about or that I'll talk about. The, the Holy Spirit is working with His power to convict you of sin, to reveal to you again the wonderful beauty of what Christ has done for you, His finished work on the cross. We are a community shaped by the gospel as we receive it as the word of God and as it works in us. We are all in the same boat. Sinners saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, revealed to us in the word of God alone. That's how we're saved. Paul knew all too well the many others who rejected the word of God, right? Who rejected his words saying, no, that's not true. I don't care what you're saying. I'm, I'm against what you're saying. No, Jesus is not the Messiah. Jesus is not my Lord. He's not my savior. I'm not going to trust in him. We know all those examples from Paul because he wrote them down for us. They're written that he was, he was beaten and he was tossed out of cities and he was left for dead because of his commitment to the word of God. But these that opposed him and that opposed the church, that opposed the gospel, 
They heard Paul's words only as the words of men. And this kind of rejection is to be expected. The gospel community in Jerusalem also knew these kinds of afflictions. Some of the Thessalonians seem to have suffered in the same way as they received the word of God. And because of this, we can relate to the suffering of others. We receive the word of God and we relate to the suffering of others. This is what Paul says to the Thessalonians. He says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. And this is building on what he said earlier in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Sounds very, very similar. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. You received the word of God in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. That, that uh, mysterious and troubling verse that James gives us in the beginning of his letter where he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. How in the world does that make sense? How do we experience joy in the face of trials? Well, Paul says the same thing here, that they receive the Holy Spirit, they receive the Word of God in the midst of great afflictions with joy through the Holy Spirit. That that the Holy Spirit, in the midst of our suffering, comes to us and shows us His goodness, shows us sometimes His purposes, in the midst of our suffering, sometimes shows us those purposes much later, sometimes doesn't show us those purposes at all. But we know he has purposes, he has work that he's doing in every affliction, every trial. The churches of God in Christ, the gospel-shaped community in Judea, suffered at the hands of the Jews. Now Paul, he doesn't pull any punches here, does he? when he describes the atrocities that were committed by the Jews. Number one, they had killed Jesus. They had killed Jesus. And Paul is they. Paul is part of them. Paul says they killed Jesus knowing full well he was the greatest persecutor of the church. If he had been there at Christ's crucifixion, he would have been dancing to jig. That's who Paul was. That's how how evil his heart was toward Christ, toward God's purposes, toward God's people. Uh, we, we, We know that the Romans are also culpable, and we can honestly and truly say we are as well, right? It was us who put Christ on the cross. It was our sin that demanded his payment, that God used to satisfy his own divine demand for justice. But Paul says here, it's the Jews. Uh, They had not only killed Jesus, they killed the prophets. Jesus had accused them uh, of this in Matthew 23 and Luke 13. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. And O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. They killed Jesus. They killed the prophets. They drove us out. We read in Acts chapter 1, there arose on that day, and this is the day when Stephen is stoned, and Paul gives his uh, approval to the execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. They drove out the Christians, and they displeased God, especially by rejecting his Messiah. And they're hostile to all men. So all of these atrocities are done against Christ and his people in order to hinder the preaching of the gospel, in order to hinder the word going out. But Paul did not let these atrocities keep him from continuing to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Jews. In every city that he visited, he went to the synagogue first, preaching to the Jews, preaching Christ. And at the same time, and it's important that you hear this, Paul did not let these atrocities turn him against the Jews. 
The promises of God made in covenant to his people must still be held forth to the Jews. There is no place in the church for anti-Semitism. There is no place in the church for that. Church history does not give a very cheery picture of how the church has treated the Jews. We must not let history be repeated here. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. No distinctions. Here we see Greek and Jew, but we know also no, no distinctions between any ethnicities, right? No, no distinctions. All need to hear the gospel, hear the word of God, receive the word of God as the word of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All these, uh, all these reminders here of what, what God uh, allowed to take place, um, they, they, they allow us to be able to relate to each other, to, to know the suffering that we go to, to know what's going on in other places or even in our own lives due to the fact that we are God's people. People, uh, there are those in the world who oppose God and his people, and they will continue to fight against God. They will continue to fight against the church. And so we gather together, we relate, we we know each other through these sufferings. It's part of what unites us as one with, within God's gospel-shaped communities. We all suffer because of what was done to Christ. But we also glory because of what God did in Christ and how he raised him from the dead. We suffer from what happens as governments take too much power upon themselves and begin to change things that are, should be left to the church or left to individual families. They speak into places where they don't belong. And we feel the effects of that. You individually in your own life may never face persecution like some of our brothers and sisters around the world where, you face, where they face it physically and even to the point of death but you do, you have, uh, I could probably go down the row and ask you, how have government uh, decisions, how have uh, workplace decisions, people who are in power, people who rule over the university, Raytheon, uh, wherever you, it is that you work, how have their decisions affected you as a Christian? And, and it's far and broad it's not, it's not just out there. It's not just 2,000 years ago. It's not just uh, over in Africa or, or where, the, where uh, uh, Islam has taken over. It's, it's here as well. There will always be, and it will grow, there will always be a threat and, a, and an opposition to God and his people. Always, until the end, until Christ returns or until he takes you home. And so we can relate to each other. We need to hear each other's stories. I do want to hear that story of how you escaped Uganda and got to Kenya safely. But that's just that's an example, isn't it, of what we're talking about. The things that happen in this, in this world that God allows, that God permits and uses in our lives for our good and His glory. So, so what happened to these Jews in Judea? Well, Paul gets pretty strong about that as well, doesn't he? He says, um, they are always filling up the measure of their sins. Filling up the measure of their sins. It's, a, it's an interesting phrase. It's an interesting way to put it. Uh, it, it what it indicates to us is that, that they... They kept storing them up. They, there was no repentance, no forgiveness, no, no means of release. And the, the, the sins just kept mounting and mounting and mounting in judgment against them. And it even comes to the point where Paul says, but the wrath has come upon them at last. And I know it sounds past tense, but it's most likely future-leaning 
Now, if it is past tense, there were some things that he could be referring to. There was a, a famine in Jerusalem that Agabus had reported uh, in A.D. 45 and 40 to 47. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus reported of a massacre of Jews in A.D. 49 in the temple courts during Passover. And in that same year, the emperor Claudius expelled Jews from Rome. Now, Paul could have been referring to those things. And that would be the wrath coming upon them, some form of judgment. But there is more, I believe, that Paul has in mind and more that he is speaking to us, that the Jews, like all those who oppose God and his people and the spread of the gospel, uh, that the wrath of God will come down on them in the end. That God will bring them to justice. Now there seems to be a difference and I and I hope you can hear this. Uh, I'm just going to state it very briefly. And uh, if you have questions about it, we can talk about it more later. But I believe that Paul actually is making a distinction here when he speaks about the Jews between Jew, the Jews as, as individuals and Israel. That he is holding out hope yet for Israel as he writes uh, in, in Romans chapter 11 that Israel will be regrafted back in, that there are people, and it's, he's speaking about the true Israel, people that believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So this does not give us grounds, as I said earlier, for anti-Semitism or to be anti-Jew, but to continue to love the Jews that we know, the Jewish people, again, need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that they can stand under his covering and not ever feel the wrath that is coming upon them. So two things we should understand from this last part here is that God's judgment of all those who are opposed to him and his people will come in the end. His judgment will come. We can be assured of that. And that leads to the second thing which means vengeance is not mine, but the Lord says vengeance is mine. Vengeance is the Lord. So whatever suffering you are going through now, whatever, whatever external persecution, pressures, opposition, it is not your job to take them out, to, to, to deal with them. Uh, God will deal with them. God will take vengeance upon all who are opposed to him, all who are opposed to his church. Rest in that. Be assured of that. You are Lessalonians. You have a community. You have a community to which you belong. You should never be alone. You're not meant to walk alone through this life, through, through the events of this life. There's some, some small event happening this afternoon. Um, what is that again? Uh, if you don't have a place to go, if you want to go and just have some good food and enjoy the ball game, go, go to Udall, go talk with Brett. He's sitting over here, a third row back from the front. Go to Udall, have a picnic, and enjoy the ball game. There's a place for you to go. If you don't have a place, go to Brett's. Go, go to Udall. Go to the Ramada 6, right behind the Udall. Go enjoy. Go enjoy the ball game. Go enjoy the, the, the fun uh, and the support of your family. Don't be alone. You never have to be alone. There's people sitting next to you, your brothers and sisters, that are walking with you. Lessalonians. God's gospel-shaped community is shaped by the Word of God through suffering. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You for this day. We thank You for the ways that You show Yourself faithful to us every single day. The way that You care for us. The way that You watch over Your people. Lord, even as we've talked about today, uh, that your gospel-shaped community is a community that you're building so that we can support each other when we suffer. So that we can share the word of God with one another. That we can live together in community that exalts you, that blesses you, 
and is so, so good for us. Lord, I, I do pray right now for those in this body, in this, in this room, who are lonely, who, who struggle with loneliness. Lord, um, those statistics are just as true here as anywhere else. But we pray that it would be less so. We pray that actually that last statement is, is false, Lord, that there's less loneliness here. But we ask that you would be the one to whom we run, that we would be uh, found in your presence, and your presence found in us, thus never being alone. But then may we also enjoy the community of the saints, the gospel-shaped community that you're building in your church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.